All right, we're going to pick back up after talking about Reynolds numbers and all that physics, and we're going to talk about some of the adaptations to flow. So the first one is that a lot of organisms are what's called dorsoventrally flat from top to bottom, so like the image on the very bottom. Other organisms might be laterally flattened for other reasons, but dorsoventral flattening is a real great adaptation to flow. It helps you kind of suck to the surface. So this is not streamlining, um, but it does help reduce drag and it keeps you from getting, um, it, you know, it keeps the flow from going over the surface of your body, but it can also, because you're so flat, it can help kick you off, off of rocks. So um, that, that being very flat can also create lift when you don't want it. So a lot of organisms might accidentally get caught up in the drift um, because of that lift. So here you can see um, Blepharicidae larva in the um, order Diptera, it's the underside, and it has these suckers on its belly um, that allow these kind of suction discs that allow them to suck down to the surface of water, um, or sorry, to the surface of rocks, and they have kind of hooks around each of their little suckers. Um, they're also adorable. Uh, this is, you can see one of the suckers and kind of some grasping prolegs on the side and <laughs> the most adorable teddy bear of her face. Um, other adaptations to flow here, you can see another dorsoventrally flattened mayfly this time, but they have claws to grip the surfaces. Um, this one has a head shield that it can use to lower down into the flow and block, block the flow. Um, and it can, because it's so flat and wide, that increased surface area creates more friction for holding on. Also being dorsally vent dorsoventrally flattened helps you slip into cracks. Um, some organisms go the opposite way and they actually um, kind of, they have a fusiform shape, more like a torpedo. And these, these organisms reduce pressure drag by delaying flow separation. And so they face into the current and they try to minimize um, the drag by facing into the current. And um, you can see this caddis fly on the side there um, has created a really streamlined tubular case. And it might do the same thing, face into the current, like the betis um, mayfly on the left, you have a neotherma uh, caddis fly on the right. Other organisms can create kind of suction by pulling their bodies down really close. So this organism doesn't use suction cups, but actually creates suction around the edge of its own body. This is called a water pinny larva. It's in the order Coleoptera, so it's a beetle, um, but it looks kind of like a limpet if you're used to our chitin, if you're used to marine ecosystems, but it's an insect. If you flip it over, you see this adorable little beetle body um, and some gills and uh, they're really neat. And then some organisms use silk to anchor themselves to the stream bed. These are black fly larvae, Simuliidae, and the order Diptera. They basically spin a sticky pad of silk that they stick down to the rock, and then they use hooks on the end of their abdomen to grab the silk and hold on. And they can also extend a little bit of silk out if they get caught up and they accidentally let go. They can extend a little bit of silk out and kind of reel themselves back in. They need very fast flows for filter feeding because they have these cephalic fans on their heads that they use to capture particles from the water column. So you only find these in very swift moving uh, currents on the surface of rocks in the middle of riffles and rapids. Similarly, there are some caddis flies that use um, not the same kind of silk, but a similar silk for case building and net building. And then there are some chironomids, which are a dipterin that also build cases from silk and sediment. Here are some net spinning caddis flies. Um, they can glue, they basically create these little nets and then they use them to capture, just like underwater spiders, capture prey that gets um, caught in the net as it moves downstream. And what's interesting is sometimes they build so many nets on the bottom of the stream that they're effectively gluing the sediment together um, through their extensive net building. What's interesting though is studies have been done that show that the, their nets become leakier at higher temperatures because the water is less viscous and moves more quickly through and around their nets. 
So these are in the family Hydrocycidae in the order Trichoptera. And then what about still water? The opposite can also be challenging. How do you move through still water? So some organisms have hairy appendages, especially on their legs, that allow them to create more thrust as they move through the water. And they, they can row, or they can flap, and um, depending on the, the type of Reynolds, the, the Reynolds number, they might do one or the other. So at high Reynolds numbers, viscous forces are trivial. And so flapping is an effective method of movement. So you can flap and that helps you move. But at low Reynolds numbers where viscous forces dominate, it's better to row. Rowing is more effective. <laughs> I hope my hand movements were helpful. Um, all right, so that's the chapter on living in the water. Hopefully it wasn't too much physics. There's a lot of physics in there. So, so take it slow and 